With the recent rise of mass censorship, data harvesting, and psychological manipulation on a global scale, we're going to be hearing a lot about George Orwell this year. Big Brother, Thought Crime, Thought Police, Room 101, 2 plus 2 equals 5, George Orwell. 1984 was published in 1949, but five years earlier, Orwell wrote a letter to Noel Wilmot about the global rise of totalitarianism, and he discusses the concerns that eventually led him to write the ultimate warning novel. Since everything that's happening all around us is conclusive proof that Orwell's warning has not been heeded, this is a good time to start from the beginning and remind ourselves that even though the world has changed a lot in the past 77 years, people's obsession with controlling us has not. Let's have a look at this letter. The most important parts are towards the end, but the letter isn't terribly long, so we'll go ahead and read all of it. Dear Mr. Wilmot, many thanks for your letter. You ask whether totalitarianism, leader worship, etc., are really on the upgrade, and instance the fact that they are not apparently growing in this country and the USA. So, Orwell had been warning about some dangerous trends. Mr. Wilmot wrote him a letter saying, Well, I don't see these trends in the United States or Great Britain, so maybe you're exaggerating the problem. I must say I believe, or fear, that taking the world as a whole, these things are on the increase. Hitler, no doubt, will soon disappear. Good call. This was written before D-Day. Hitler, no doubt, will soon disappear, but only at the expense of strengthening A. Stalin, check, B. The Anglo-American millionaires, check, and C. All sorts of petty Fuhrers of the type of de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle was a French military officer who refused to accept the armistice with Germany. He went to Great Britain and led the Free France Movement. He was popular enough among the French for leading the resistance that he was later elected president of France. All the national movements everywhere, even those that originate in resistance to German domination, seem to take non-democratic forms to group themselves round some superhuman Fuhrer Hitler in Germany, Stalin in the Soviet Union, Salazar in Portugal, Franco in Spain, Gandhi in India, De Valera in Ireland are all varying examples, and to adopt the theory that the end justifies the means. So here's the pattern that Orwell sees. People come to fear some threat from some enemy, and they rally around some leader who's going to rescue them from the enemy but they adopt an end-justifies-the-means attitude. They'll let their leader get away with lying, manipulation, intimidation, mass censorship, mass surveillance, and even brutal violence, as long as the leader is standing against the enemy. The allegiance to some superhuman leader can take different forms. Stalin was obviously very different from Gandhi. But Orwell is focused on making a person the focus of one's loyalty. Everywhere, the world movement seems to be in the direction of centralized economies which can be made to work in an economic sense, but which are not democratically organized and which tend to establish a caste system. A centralized economy is an economy that's controlled by some central authority, usually the government, rather than by market forces. Orwell was a democratic socialist. He thought the economy should be controlled, but controlled by the people, not by leaders who are going to use their position for their own economic advantage. Animal Farm, the most epic smackdown of Soviet-style socialism ever, was published a year after Orwell wrote this letter. With this go the horrors of emotional nationalism and a tendency to disbelieve in the existence of objective truth because all the facts have to fit in with the words and prophecies of some infallible Fuhrer. In other words, once people rally around some leader who's going to protect them from some enemy, they become so loyal to that leader that their decisions are made primarily based on loyalty rather than on facts or evidence. I would add that people who hate the leader, 
can do the same thing. Their decisions can be made based on their anger against the leader rather than on facts or evidence. Consider two recent examples. Was the election stolen from Donald Trump? You can put the exact same evidence in front of someone who loves Trump and someone who hates Trump, and the person who loves Trump will say, yes, the election was clearly stolen from Donald Trump, while the person who hates Trump will say, no, Joe Biden won fair and square. Similarly, this has been popping up in a ton of videos over the past two days, did Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez lie about or misrepresent the danger she was in during the Capitol Hill siege? Go look at how people are answering that question on Twitter. People who love AOC say that she didn't lie about or misrepresent anything. People who hate AOC say that she lied and should be removed from office. When people are looking at the exact same evidence and giving contradictory answers to questions, it becomes clear that truth and facts aren't the deciding factor. At least one side is making decisions based on something other than truth and facts. Now, if your blood pressure just skyrocketed as soon as I mentioned Trump or AOC, or if you're freaking out because I mentioned them without showering the one you like with praise or heaping abuse on the one you don't like, you're the sort of person Orwell is talking about. Truth takes a back seat to loyalty or rage. What happens when this trend continues? Already, history has, in a sense, ceased to exist, i.e., there is no such thing as a history of our own times which could be universally accepted, and the exact sciences are endangered as soon as military necessity ceases to keep people up to the mark. Hitler can say that the Jews started the war, and if he survives, that will become official history. He can't say that two and two are five, because for the purposes of, say, ballistics, they have to make four. But if the sort of world that I am afraid of arrives, a world of two or three great superstates which are unable to conquer one another, two and two could become five if the Fuhrer wished it. That, so far as I can see, is the direction in which we are actually moving. Though, of course, the process is reversible. These parts about three great superstates that can't conquer one another and two plus two becoming five should sound familiar if you've read 1984. But notice this part about the sciences becoming endangered so long as they're not needed for something like waging war. Think about a topic like gender. Gender has a biological definition. It's ultimately a scientific concept. But what happens if a powerful enough group decides to completely redefine things? Suddenly, you have to abandon the biological definition, and if you don't immediately abandon the biological definition and accept the new definition without question, you become an instant target for destruction. We're all being trained to say that 2 plus 2 equals 5 on command. 2 plus 2 could become 5 tomorrow. All we would need for that to happen is a popular trend on social media claiming that if you don't believe 2 plus 2 is 5, you're a racist. As to the comparative immunity of Britain and the USA, whatever the pacifists, etc. may say, we have not gone totalitarian yet, and this is a very hopeful symptom. I wonder what Orwell would think of big tech taking over the public square, engaging in mass censorship, and selling user data. I believe very deeply, as I explained in my book The Lion and the Unicorn, in the English people and in their capacity to centralize their economy without destroying freedom in doing so. But one must remember that Britain and the USA haven't been really tried. They haven't known defeat or severe suffering, and there are some bad symptoms to balance the good ones. To begin with, there is the general indifference to the decay of democracy. Do you realize, for instance, that no one in England under 26 now has a vote, and that so far as one can see, the great mass of people of that age don't give a damn for this? Secondly, and here's where things get interesting, there is the fact 
that the intellectuals are more totalitarian in outlook than the common people. The intellectuals are more totalitarian in outlook than the common people. On the whole, the English intelligentsia have opposed Hitler, but only at the price of accepting Stalin. Most of them are perfectly ready for dictatorial methods, secret police, systematic falsification of history, etc., so long as they feel that it is on our side. Sound familiar? Are the politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers and tech CEOs of our time against totalitarianism? Or are they perfectly ready for dictatorial methods, secret police, systematic falsification of history, etc., so long as they feel that it's on their side? This goes back to the point about the end justifying the means. The reasoning of a tech CEO or a journalist goes something like this. Well, yes, it's regrettable that we have to censor anyone we disagree with and that we have to try to destroy their lives. But the people who disagree with us are so evil that we have a moral obligation to silence them by any means necessary. Indeed, the statement that we haven't a fascist movement in England largely means that the young, at this moment, look for their Fuhrer elsewhere. One can't be sure that that won't change, nor can one be sure that the common people won't think ten years hence as the intellectuals do now. I hope they won't. I even trust they won't. But if so, it will be at the cost of a struggle. If one simply proclaims that all is for the best and doesn't point to the sinister symptoms, one is merely helping to bring totalitarianism nearer. And here we're starting to see why he wrote 1984. If you don't point to the symptoms, if you don't expose what's going on, you're helping to bring totalitarianism nearer. You also ask, if I think the world tendency is towards fascism, why do I support the war? It is a choice of evils. I fancy nearly every war is that. I know enough of British imperialism not to like it, but I would support it against Nazism or Japanese imperialism as the lesser evil. Similarly, I would support the USSR against Germany because I think the USSR cannot altogether escape its past and retains enough of the original ideas of the revolution to make it a more hopeful phenomenon than Nazi Germany. I think, and have thought ever since the war began in 1936 or thereabouts, that our cause is the better. But we have to keep on making it the better, which involves constant criticism. Yours sincerely, George Orwell. Our cause is better, but we have to keep making it better, and this involves constant criticism. We have to criticize dangerous trends in our own nations, in our own groups, among adherents of our own ideologies. Notice the obvious difference between, on the one hand, constant criticism for the sake of making your cause better, and, on the other hand, the sort of leader worship or ideology worship that conditions people to have an emotional outburst whenever the leader or the ideology is criticized in any way. Silencing critics clears the path to totalitarianism. And that's why the most dangerous leaders and ideologies don't just demand unquestioning obedience from their followers, but must also silence their opponents through censorship, intimidation, and violence. For more insights from George Orwell, be sure to watch my video, Orwell's Review of Hitler's Mein Kampf, a lesson for today. It'll help you help others resist the forces that are obsessed with controlling you and everyone around you.